So you've joined us once again, and a curious question has already formed in your mind. Why would the bustling metropolis New York City, the Big Apple, the city that never sleeps, choose to demolish one of its most treasured architectural icons? Pennsylvania Station, adorned in rich Beaux-Arts glory, was once a proud beacon in the rapidly growing New York skyline. Each of its ornate waiting rooms, broad concourses and grand staircases were works of art, echoing stories of countless journeys and heartfelt reunions whispered in the hallowed echoes of its cavernous halls. Yet, as the bard would say, therein lies the rub. How did such a remarkable monument to grandeur and elegance succumb to the swing of the wrecking ball, replaced by a functional but far less awe-inspiring transportation hub? In today's episode of Old Money Mansions, we will guide you through the captivating story of its creators, their daring vision to construct such a grand station in the heart of America's largest city, and its unfortunate downfall as we describe why New York's most beautiful public building was demolished. In order to answer this question fully, of course, we'll have to explain why the legendary old Penn Station in New York was built in the first place. In the beginning, it was meticulously designed as a formidable competitor to New York's Grand Central Terminal, with the clear aim to endow the Pennsylvania Railroad with an uninterrupted conduit into Manhattan, indisputably the paramount economic hub in America during that period. Before the rise of this iconic early 20th century landmark, Manhattan's only railway gateway was monopolized by the Vanderbilt family's New York Central Railroad, which came from the north across the Harlem River. The transportation landscape of New York was indeed considerably restricted, with only the New York Central Railroad having the privilege of direct entry into Manhattan through Grand Central. This created a rather challenging scenario for other railroads, particularly the Pennsylvania Railroad, seeking to establish a direct presence in the city. The Pennsylvania Railroad's initiative to break this monopoly was spearheaded by its president, Alexander Cassatt, who commissioned the construction of Penn Station. Born in 1839 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Alexander Johnston Cassatt was the seventh president of the company, with his tenure running from June 9, 1899, until his death on December 28, 1906. Alexander was the eldest amongst his siblings, and his career trajectory began as an engineer with the Pennsylvania Railroad. Over the years, Cassatt proved himself a maestro in managing transportation logistics. In order to gain proper training, he first graduated from the distinguished Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, a rigorous academic institution that also nurtured the genius behind the design of the Brooklyn Bridge. Washington Roebling. Now, Cassatt's uncompromising work ethic, exemplary integrity and steadfast commitment to the railroad, its workforce and stakeholders set him apart. His monumental achievements during the Industrial Age propelled him into the sights of the era's luminaries such as Vanderbilt, Rockefeller and Morgan. In fact, he was one of the rare individuals to be known to have the sincere respect of financier J.P. Morgan. For the monumental task of constructing the old New York Penn Station, Cassatt entrusted the architectural firm McKim, Mead and White, a decision influenced by their reputable standing and successful past projects. Founded by Charles Follen McKim, William Rutherford Mead and Stanford White, this firm was instrumental in shaping the architectural practice, urbanism and the paradigms of the American Renaissance in New York at the turn of the century. Known for their distinct Beaux-Arts masterpieces, which drew heavy inspiration from their European travels, the firm was responsible for several notable works, such as Columbia University's Library, the Brooklyn Museum in New York City, the Boston Public Library, and numerous opulent residences in Newport, Rhode Island. In his quest for a grand and monumental station, Cassatt found the perfect partner in McKim, Mead, and White whose reputation for designing such iconic structures made them the ideal choice for the project. Their prominence in the architectural realm and their ability to craft recognizable landmarks undoubtedly played a substantial role in Cassatt's decision to commission them for the creation of Penn Station. The station, completed in 1910, was more than just an architectural spectacle. It was a glittering beacon of engineering innovation. In fact, the construction necessitated the creation of underwater tunnels beneath the Hudson River, a feat previously unachieved. Before Penn Station, passengers traveling from New Jersey to Manhattan had to complete their journey by ferry. However, the emergence of Penn Station revolutionized this commute, ushering passengers into a beautifully intricate towering sanctuary, forever altering the city's transportation landscape. Delving into the architectural marvel that was the original Penn Station in New York, the immediate standout feature 
was the imposing facade along 7th Avenue, with its northerly and southerly entrances equipped to admit carriages and a central entrance designed for pedestrians. It was indeed a sight to behold. This centerpiece comprised six Doric columns, the most modest of the Greek orders, supporting a subdued entablature crowned with a distinctive medallion. The column spacing, interestingly, takes inspiration from Bernini's Piazza in Rome. The structure was fashioned in the Beaux-Arts style, a tribute to the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris, the epoch's most prominent and influential architectural institution. The Beaux-Arts style draws heavily from historical precedents, primarily the classical Greek and Roman aesthetics. In keeping with this tradition, the grand waiting room, towering above the rest of the station, was modelled after the baths of Caracalla from ancient Rome. As passengers navigated through the interior of the original Penn Station, they would observe two contrasting segments of this grand edifice. On the left, the waiting room with its impressive ceiling, and on the right, the train shed leading to the platforms. The waiting room immediately commanded attention with its vaulted, coffered ceiling, exquisitely carved out of stone, while a similar design, fashioned in steel, graces the train shed. However, the train shed swapped stone coffers for small panes of glass, serving as skylights, subtly illuminating the space. The similarity in the groin vault seen in both sections makes a striking impression. Going deeper into the waiting room, arrivals could not help but notice the colossal entrances and exits bordering 7th and 8th avenues. Furthermore, stairways leading to 33rd and 31st streets were perfectly positioned at the ends, complemented by enormous clearestry windows that allow natural light to flood the hall. The coffered ceiling is fashioned out of travertine, meticulously quarried from Tivoli on the outskirts of Rome. Interestingly, this is the same stone that was used to construct Rome's famed Colosseum thousands of years prior. What set this room apart, however, was its astounding scale. We must truly marvel at the soaring heights of this enormous space, dwarfing its occupants. It was undoubtedly not just one of New York's finest public spaces, but also a globally significant architectural wonder of its time. Ascending from the train platform into the station, travelers first encountered the extraordinary skylit train shed. Its design drew inspiration from the renowned train sheds of Europe, yet the forms resonated strongly with the stonework of the central waiting room. What makes this structure particularly intriguing is the advanced engineering that went into its construction, a testament to the technological prowess of the era. The entire structure, including the columns, beams and arches, were assembled from smaller sections, all painstakingly riveted together to create an intricately laced framework. Thus, Penn Station, completed 10 years into the 20th century, was not only an architectural masterpiece, but also an exemplar of the era's engineering sophistication. Now, intriguingly, the old Penn Station was not birthed from the generous hands of the government, state or city. A private corporation, the proud proprietor of the land and edifice, was the mastermind behind this grand venture. This fact, though seemingly insignificant at the time, would later come to play a pivotal role in the station's tragic demise. You see, the downfall of the old New York Penn Station was a result of a broader narrative of decline that plagued the railroad industry, and specifically the financial predicaments of the Pennsylvania Railroad. This enormous station in the heart of Manhattan, amidst one of the nation's priciest real estate markets, proved increasingly burdensome for the company to maintain. By the twilight of its glory days, old New York Penn Station had shed much of its original grandeur due to a confluence of factors, among them the waning appeal of rail travel and the advent of alternative modes of transport, notably air travel. By then, the proliferation of automobiles and the dawn of the jet age had significantly reshaped people's traveling preferences, culminating in a dramatic decrease in demand for train services. Between 1945 and 1964, non-commuter rail passenger travel plummeted by a staggering 84% as more Americans chose to journey by car or airplane. In a landmark shift in 1955, air travel in the United States surpassed train travel for the first time. By 1957, airliners had overtaken ocean liners as the favored means of traversing the Atlantic. This declining demand dealt a devastating blow to train stations, leading to their neglect and eventual demolition or repurposing. The desire for alternative revenue sources, 
such as leasing the air rights above the station or converting the land for other uses, also fueled the demolition of these grand structures. The dwindling interest in train travel was not only a product of the rise of air travel, but also stemmed from the expanding highway system in the United States. The creation of high-speed four-lane corridors facilitated road travel, further undermining passenger rail travel. Additionally, the stringent sanctions and regulations imposed by the Interstate Commerce Commission or the ICC on the railroad industry significantly contributed to the waning fortunes of railroads. Consequently, the once awe-inspiring station progressively devolved into a grimy, deteriorating shadow of its former self. The exterior, once adorned with ornate pink granite, was now covered in filth, and the interior marred by the intrusion of advertisements and modern alterations, detracting significantly from its original grandeur. Noted architectural theorist and critic, Lewis Mumford, in 1958, described the station as dingy, dark and cheerless, a mournful elegy to its fallen glory. Now, William Zeckendorf, a renowned real estate magnate, entered into a pivotal agreement with Pennsylvania Railroad President James Symes in 1955, laying claim to the air rights of Penn Station. Born in the modest town of Paris, Illinois, Zeckendorf relocated to the bustling metropolis of New York City at the tender age of three. He forsook formal education at New York University to dive into the cutthroat world of real estate. A daring gambler at heart, Zeckendorf Sr. had a flair for gathering land parcels for monumental projects. Among his crowning achievements was the meticulous assembly of 75 parcels of land on the affluent east side of Manhattan, which would subsequently morph into the site of the United Nations. He had a hand in the development of iconic sites such as Century City in Los Angeles, Roosevelt Field Shopping Center on Long Island, along with various urban renewal endeavors in Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. Furthermore, he collaborated with some of the most illustrious architects of the time, including the likes of I.M. Pei and Le Corbusier, for his grand projects. Zeckendorf Sr. had a reputation for being a visionary in the realm of real estate development. Unfazed by debt, he considered it a lever for his grand plans. He once famously quipped, I'd rather be alive at 18% than dead at the prime rate. However, his penchant for risk-taking would ultimately be his downfall, leading to his bankruptcy in 1965 and the subsequent loss of his entire portfolio to creditors. Now, the lucrative mid-Manhattan station site was the prime allure for Zeckendorf's involvement in the Penn Station project. Initially, Zeckendorf conceived a plan to replace the station with a Palace of Progress, a merchandise mart of colossal proportions. However, in a strange turn of events, the Pennsylvania Railroad decided to cede its air rights for a new Madison Square Garden and an office tower. Thus, in 1961, the Pennsylvania Railroad executives made the fateful decision to dismantle the station and lease out its airspace to supplement their income. This triggered a public outcry, with droves of people protesting the decision in August 1962. The Action Group for Better Architecture was established to spearhead the efforts to salvage the Beaux-Arts structure, but their endeavors were to no avail. The demolition of Penn Station, a heart-rending spectacle, commenced on October 28, 1963, and lasted until 1968. Workers began tearing down the majestic limestone walls, stone eagles, and towering 30-foot-tall Doric columns. The demolition, a pivotal event that captured the media's attention, marked the bitter end of an era for this iconic edifice. In a bittersweet end to the tale, the demise of the old New York Penn Station proved to be the catalyst that ignited the modern historic preservation movement in the United States. The monumental loss spurred the establishment of the Landmarks Preservation Commission and effected a change in the city's development priorities, thereby saving other historic structures such as New York City's legendary Grand Central Terminal. The preservation movement that sprang from the ashes of Penn Station has since been instrumental in the protection of thousands of architecturally, historically and culturally significant buildings and sites across the country. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. Do you have any other famous buildings that have been demolished that you're curious to hear the story of? We'd love your input, as we're just getting the channel going. And if you're passionate about seeing more information on New York City's gilded past, why not click the video on screen to hear the saga of the now demolished Charles M. Schwab Mansion. We'll see you there, and thanks again for joining us on another episode of Old Money Mansions.